And our final speaker this morning at this opening ceremony is a journalist and director general of the German public broadcaster WDR. He's been in various media roles since 1986, so very well seasoned, and currently he works as an editor and reporter at the most viewed German nightly news. We're not kidding when we say that it really is the most watched news show here, the Tagesschau. Please help me welcome Mr. Tom Bureau. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies. Thank you for having me. Peter Materna, thank you for putting me and everybody in the right uh, state of mind. It was also almost uh, meditative. And Peter Limburg, thank you for hosting this event. It's my first time here at the uh, Global Media Forum, and I already have a, 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 a real sense of the value and of the purpose of free media and it brings to mind something that uh, some of us uh, have learned to take for granted, but it is not to be taken for granted, as we've heard and as we can feel today. Now, uh, you all come from all over the world. Let me uh, improvise a little introduction. And uh, you remind me of uh, the diversity of and, and the role that media play uh, in the world. And some of you may have a government background. Some may have a public broadcasting background. Some may have a, a commercial uh, broadcasting background. I am uh, spent, as you've heard, all of my professional life in public broadcasting as a regional, national, international reporter and correspondent as host of the nightly news. And then, zam, the fun ended and they brought me into the <laughs> PDG or the CEO chair where you have to be responsible for everything and everybody. Uh, you can't report anymore. But it also broadens your view and it broadens the responsibilities because uh, a large public broadcasting station uh, has not only, and WDR not only uh, has the journalism field that I worked in all my life, uh, but now the responsibilities include more than journalism. It includes a vast section for made-for-TV movies with vast budget responsibilities, six radio channels, uh, vast technical facilities for distribution, etc., etc., etc. So it has broadened the responsibilities a lot. Um, as you probably know, all over Europe, public broadcasting is under immense pressure, pressure of different kinds. Uh, some say we should concentrate on the core and not have such vast responsibilities as I've just uh, told you. But then the question is, what is the core? What are the core responsibilities of public broadcasting? I want to take the opportunity this morning um, to pitch for a broad public broadcasting uh, service. And that leads to the first question opening is, why do we need it in the first place? Why do we need public broadcasters? What do we contribute to society that other commercial entities could not contribute today, especially with the new digital distribution facilities available to almost everybody? What should we contribute? When we think, first of all, I've told you a little bit about broad responsibility. So for the recipient, for the customer, so to speak, that means that different people will think of different things when they think of public broadcasting. Some remember their latest crime movie that they've seen on TV. Uh, someone may be reminded of the local news story they've seen on their or heard on their radio station. Someone else may associate it with music after listening to a concert by our symphony orchestra. By the way, symphonic orchestras, orchestras uh, as entities of public broadcasting, question mark? I'll get back to that a little later. Some people may think of sports news, children's television, investigative journalistic magazines, and these are just a few examples of the many things that we offer. And all of these different broadcasts and many more are part of our mission because they belong to our society. The public broadcasting stations are part of the mass media, no doubt about it, which aims to reach a large percentage of the population. We are broadcasters. Now let's look at the term broadcast. Broad is clear. It means broad, wide. And cast means to throw something, to cast a fishing rod, for example. So you throw something out there, you spread content in order to reach a wide audience. One broadcaster, many recipients. That's the nature of broadcasting. So in fact, it's the very definition of mass media. And also newspapers with many readers or commercial radio stations are also mass media, a mass of people using the same device. 
This also means that this service, whether it be a newspaper, radio station, or television program, has to represent a cross-section of the people's interests. Now, only a few people read a newspaper from front to back. My father he says, I paid for it, I'm going to read it from front to back. But some read the sports section, others prefer just the economy section and culture, and some head straight for the political section. Or some skim the front page to turn to the crossword puzzles. And nobody watches one TV station 24 hours a day. Everybody has, however, the entire selection of broadcasts at his or her disposal. And that's an important point. There is a chance that the person will view content which he or she might otherwise not have been interested in. We, we could call it collateral information. You didn't necessarily want to read it or watch it, but you kept viewing and you still took it in. So what we're experiencing on the Internet, in contrast, is the very opposite of that. The range of information online is so incredibly broad that nobody can keep track of it anymore, and this requires new content filters. We no longer receive, although the broad content is out there, we no longer receive it. We don't receive a full range of broadcasts on our smartphones. We only receive the information we subscribe to. That's the opposite of broadcast. We might even call it narrowcast, information that has been narrowed down to certain topics for a very well-defined group. What difference will it make? Well, on one hand, society's common base of knowledge will change. Previously, there were only a certain number of programs, 10, maybe 20 channels, that people watched and listened to, and these programs were meant for everybody and therefore covered many different subjects. Many things we were interested in and other things we weren't bought to be bothered with, but we still absorbed them unintentionally. So one could assume that most people in a society shared a common base of knowledge. Now, if everybody only uses a handful of information sources among thousands with very specific content, the chance that millions of users share a common base has become significantly smaller. Everybody has his or her specific content, but common knowledge decreases. That's the first thing that will change. The second thing that will change is the strategy adopted by media companies to respond to it. Users no longer want the full package designed to please everybody, so media companies are looking for solutions by creating different products for different areas of interest. There used to be one sports section in the newspaper where you found everything from ice hockey to soccer. Now, I witnessed this, and as always, you can look into a kaleidoscope of the future when you go to the United States, and I witnessed this in, uh, at New York airports, but almost any uh, U.S. airport, already ten year, more than 10 years ago. You watched these stands of free magazines that you had, and what did you have? You had special areas of interest. You had a, a fishing magazine, you had a um, um, real estate magazine, you had golfing magazines, etc., etc., etc. It was already a fragmentation of publications. Um, this has reached Europe, and actually it has reached the world. The German tabloid newspaper called Bild, which is the largest newspaper in distribution, uh, now has its own channel on Facebook for every single football soccer club in the Bundesliga. Such channels no longer reach a broad range of people, or the public, but only specific groups of fans. Thus, society is divided into countless segments or subgroups. We're basically dealing with the impact of individualism. Now that sounds good. We now have the technology which allows everybody to become completely individualized. On Facebook, Netflix, or Spotify, people can assemble their very own content and taste. You might think that sounds perfect or it sounds good. And it, it does have some value for us. But I believe that the mechanisms behind this technology, they will have consequences for a democratic society, however we view them. Especially now we're not able to sift through the floods of information, but we have to depend on someone else. And this someone else is not a person, it's an algorithm. Let's take Facebook. Facebook puts together an individual news feed for the user, containing news from friends, media content he or she has subscribed to, cat content, advertisements, whatever it may be. Our news feed can get pretty crowded. 
That is why Facebook chooses the information it thinks the user would like the most. Now, you know this. The user should not get bored or be exposed to things he doesn't want to see because then he would spend less time on the platform. But the longer he stays on the platform, the more money the platform makes. So this is a business model. It's not uh, some purpose model. Let's imagine a newspaper. You would normally need to skim through all the different articles and see which one is of interest to you, which one is of relevance. If a newspaper functioned like Facebook, it would be like somebody taking your daily newspaper and cutting out, clipping out the articles that support your specific opinions and interests. And then you would only be shown these selected cutout articles. The rest would be tossed out and thrown away. Science has talked about this phenomenon and referring to it as filter bubble. Let's face it and admit it, everybody sits in his or her filter bubble and only lets the things through that, or at least um, preferably through, that supports his or her opinions and values. Some say it's the echo chamber. There are different, different names and words for it. But Facebook and companies like that make sure that you only see and hear the things that you shout into the system or that you fed into the system as your interest. That's not exclusive to the Internet, actually. It is a very common psychological phenomenon. We are social creatures. We form packs, sometimes we follow packs, and we want the pack to like us. Humans seek an environment which will reflect their own values and opinions. It's a, it's a human natural thing. They also tend to read a daily newspaper that will reinforce their political views. That's also not new. That's why we had a fragmented and a diverse um, newspaper society. But according to some theories, social media increase amplify, accelerate this effect. And what happens when I only see posts that support my opinions and when I rarely hear opinions that oppose my view? Well, I have to get the feeling that everybody else thinks like me. And this may lead to the conclusion that I belong to the majority. In the worst case scenario, many small groups would form with people believing that they are A, right, and B, that they are the majority. Facts that are contradicting their existing views are perceived as wrong or fake news. This would lead to the formation of numerous subgroups where everybody defends their own perceived truth. Now probably, at least that's my personal opinion, probably this effect is not as strong as some social scientists have feared it might be. It's an effect and it's amplified by technology, but it basically is a normal human thing and it still can be corrected by counter-information. The bubble, the bubble uh, theory, the filter bubble theory is controversial, but I, I am convinced that there is a tendency towards this behavior. That, that means no reason to panic in my view, but it may be a cause of concern and something to reflect upon. And this is where basically public broadcasting comes in with its responsibilities towards society, because society needs public discussions. Compromises need to be negotiated. Members of society also have to deal with topics which don't always fit harmoniously with their view of the world. And we've just heard uh, Michelle talking as a member of the Bundestag. It's, you have to, it's a nitty-gritty business in democracies to form compromises. And it doesn't always cater to the view, oh, this is right and this is wrong. Things aren't simple. The world is complex. And you need a, an informed public to understand and be capable to understand complexities. I believe that the debate culture, especially here in German society, still works relatively well. And I've witnessed uh, myself in the U.S., how discussions were getting more and more polarized over the years and over the decades. And you can see also there, in, like in a kaleidoscope of the future, what that might lead to, what that has political, uh, how, uh, that has political consequences. And that when you ask for what, what counter-medicine do we have, what countermeasures can we take, I believe that these countermeasures involve supporting public broadcasting institutions, as you might not be surprised to hear from me. Why? Firstly, because people trust us. In Germany, uh, we have um, 
we have, uh, me, uh, we have meters and examinations to monitor this. It doesn't matter what study you look at, the outstanding majority of Germans consider public broadcasting to be trustworthy. And secondly, people have severe doubts concerning the credibility and trustworthiness of content on the Internet. It's funny, because the Internet is, well, it's just a technical device of distribution, uh, and you find everything from encyclopedia to very doubtful uh, media and sources. But people have a vague distrust for the Internet, because they know instinctively that everything that comes from the Internet is not automatically checked for facts. And there's another reason why public broadcasters are perfect, in my view, for transferring knowledge to a fragmented society, and that is our overall reach. I told you I would make the pitch for broad public broadcasting. <laughs> Recently, ARD launched a survey in order to define its overall reach. In other words, how many people are reached by all the different ARD st stations, be it TV, Internet, radio, whatever it may be. The result, every day we reach about 60% of the German population, with different media channels. 94% of Germans use one of ARD's media channels at least once a week. Not every single one of our projects is appreciated by the entire population. Of course not. Some of our channels are popular with certain subgroups in particular. But the sum total of our subgroups is huge. We have so many channels and such a wide range of content that we have an impact on people across different social groups despite their filter bubbles. This broad-reaching impact prevents the filter bubble phenomenon and creates a common base of knowledge. I see this as an extremely important thing for a functioning democracy in a free society. And in regards to the German TV license fee for public service broadcasting, Rundfunkbeitrag, because we're financed by this fee, it's a mandatory fee, to all those that say, I only want to pay for the service I use, it's the pay-as-you-go crowd, I have to point out that people do not only benefit from our services, they use themselves. Our contributors also benefit from the service that someone else uses. We empower people, at least that's our purpose, who form their own opinion. We provide an easy access to information, which is socially relevant. On this basis, the people in this country can participate in the social decision-making process, which in turn guarantees that the interests of all citizens are incorporated in that decision-making process. Therefore, the public service broadcasters represent a key contribution to democracy, which benefits every single member of society, every single member of society, even the ones that prefer other, maybe commercial entities, for their distraction or information. Now, um, I skip a few, I don't want to make it too long for you, I skip a few parts that I had prepared for you. Um, I want to get to a self-critical point, which we have to sometimes also admit, especially in the journalistic field. Now I'm basically narrowing it down to, to the journalism in whatever media, radio, TV, or Internet. Mm. When we talk about filter bubbles, we have to admit journalists also live in filter bubbles, all journalists, not just public broadcasting journalists, uh, newspaper journalists, everybody does. <clears throat> Where do most journalists live? They live in cities and metropolitan areas with a multicultural mix of people. On average, journalists have also gone through higher education, and they often belong to a digital media avant-garde. But many people in our societies have very, live, they live very different lives. They may live in the countryside, in small towns. The majority of them did not graduate from a university. These people often feel that journalists have very li a little idea of how they live and what motivates them, what moves them. And this also applies to the public service broadcasters, as I'm sure it does when we have to take measures to combat this lack of awareness. That doesn't mean we have to identify with or cater to or endorse the concerns and views of each group in our societies. But it means we need to listen. We need to be aware of the different viewpoints. We need to be unbiased and ask if these concerns are justified or not. Oftentimes we do a lot of almost like public hearings where we go around the, uh, this state where we broadcast in and where our journalists just listen. They say, what concerns do you have? We don't broadcast these things. It's just to get input. You know, and oftentimes we get the 
we get this sure feeling that this is not about certain facts or certain stories that we convey in our newscasts. It's not that people don't trust the correctness of the facts that we have, but they, they distrust that we have a right feeling and empathy for how they live and what their priorities are. And, that, and that's the worst thing, when they get the feeling that you look down on them, that you're condescending. So this is my message always when we have internal meetings. We must, you know, remember, I, don't, I think it was Google or something, don't, don't be evil or something. I said, we must not be arrogant. We must not be perceived as arrogant. It's very, very important. No matter how avant-garde my own life may be or metropolitan or cosmopolitan, many people live different lives. We have to respect them and have to feel that we respect them. It's a very, very important thing. Well, that seems to strike a global chord. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if, if, if social participation is based on the fact that public broadcasters reach all classes and all layers of society, we have to make sure that they do. Our job is to create a, prog is, uh, it's to create a program for everybody, not almost everybody. Now, in closure, there are some in all over Europe this is happening, uh, where societies ask, are our public broadcasting entities too large? Are they too big? Is the monthly fee, in Germany it's approximately 20 US dollars, or approaching to 20 US dollars um, per month, we have a combined, all the stations combined, and radio and TV and what have not, the regional, the national ones, have a budget of over 7 billion US dollars, over 7 billion euros. Is it too large? Well, I, I hope that I have made a, a pitch that a, a broad public broadcasting serves not only the special interests that somebody may have. We have a radio channel only for culture, which means high culture, so to speak. It's classical music, it's avant-garde music, at night it's jazz, but it's not popular music, mainstream music. So, of course, you don't have as many viewers. That's actually more expensive to provide to cater to these groups than to others. But my pitch is that the sum total of what we deliver uh, contributes to an educated, well-informed, and well-entertained, yes, also well-entertained society with a humanist ideal of, of the people behind it. We also have, you might be surprised to hear, orchestras. Yes, I, I, I know that even uh, uh, commercial uh, broadcasters in the U.S., for example, they used to have whole orchestras, but it was for score music for their, um, before the movies um, came into TV, and TV was invented uh, to uh, entice uh, programs, like, for example, remember War of the Worlds uh, by, um, uh, by Orson Welles, that these things needed movies. They were like, mo like movies for the ear in, in, in radio. But... They discarded these orchestras after the media landscape changed. We did not. We still have them. And that's part of the broad things that we do. We sent them out to schools. We sent them out to the public so that they're not just in the ivory tower of high culture, but that people in our state of Northern Rhine-Westphalia get a sense that they serve them, that they're there for them, that they're their orchestra. So, ladies and gentlemen, despite all the pressures we have to endure, I strongly object to those who say our time with this broad scope of responsibilities is up. I believe that in the digital age, public broadcasters have a more important role to play than ever before. Thank you so much for your attention and for the rest of this day, and you may get the punchline now in a few seconds. I wish you a lot of joy also. <laughs> Thank you very much.